the rise from Lausanne, Switzerland, where nursery schools and badly needed barbershops are open once again. I am Damien Hodari, Professor of Strategic Management at the Ecole Hotelier de Lausanne. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're joining us from around the world. My name is Anita Menderotta, and I'm in, believe it or not, sunny London. It is a great pleasure to have you with us all, and we're delighted that you're joining us on this journey of RISE, this being our second edition. As we said last week, the whole purpose of RISE is for all of us in the travel, tourism, and hospitality space to have a place to come together, to, during these times of crisis, separate the news from the noise, and find a place where we can actually have a conversation, discuss some of the questions around the future of our industry and have a bit of a laugh because we all certainly need that. We're very excited to say that last week for the first episode we had people joining us from over 55 countries around the world and 45 academic institutions. A remarkable, remarkable response. We are thrilled that you're joining us again today and as you can see the theme of today is the next normal. Now why did we call it the next normal? Simply this, Many people are talking about the new normal. That's the term that's being used pretty much widespread across the world. But Damien and I believe clearly that it's actually not about the new normal. It's about getting a sense of what's the next normal because we're in completely uncharted territory and those waters are going to get rough. They might get calm, they might get rough again. So let's figure out the next normal. And in doing so, let's get a sense to again, have those conversations, hear the questions. Because what we found is that from our feedback last week, you want more opportunity to exchange. And that is fantastic, because that is the whole purpose of this initiative. So we thank you for joining us. We thank you very much for again, taking this journey with you. And we look forward to the next episode. And I'm gonna hand over to Damien to explain a little bit more about how we're gonna get engaged. Well, we're going to begin a little bit with reviewing some of the feedback that you gave us last week. We asked you several poll questions, including one at the end of the show, for some feedback about the episode that you had just watched. And we listened and we took some great ideas from you, including, uh, most importantly, having some question and answers throughout the show, not only at the end, and especially with the executives and residents that will be joining us a little bit later. And as Anita mentioned, this is a conversation between us and you. This is a show with you, not just for you. And so we want to start this show right away with you with the following question. Which of the following do you believe you will do within two months of restrictions being lifted? So, as we said, we wanted to get a sense of where in the world are we now? Like we said last week as well, we don't want to be inundating you with lots of slides and lots of charts, but we do want to separate, as we said, the news from the noise. We want to be able to find indicators to find, so what's the situation in the world? I'm gonna take you very quickly through, where are we in the world? As we said, we didn't want to go into information that's going to be repeating. So I pulled together the next slide for you. And we pulled together three primary sources, the World Health Organization for the virus and where it is, just good to know, Oxford Economics on how governments have responded, and third, we also had the WTO in terms of GDP, the wealth of nations. What has changed in the last week? Very importantly, 14 European countries have started easing their domestic restrictions around mobility. It allows people, as Damien said, to get people going back and get their hair cut, which I thought is interesting that it's an essential service. Kitties are going back to school. People are starting to expand their bubbles. Still, social distancing remains. All of those rules are required. It's getting people to almost adjust to the next normal of being out in the world, but not too close up to one another to make sure we're all safe. Linked to this, face masks are now being regulated by all citizens, homemade the best ones so we don't deprive the medical industry. Because what we're finding is that as much as there is confidence with curves being flattened, there's a very good chance we're going to have a second wave. And we're seeing that happening in Asia where countries that relieved gave a great exhale of relief about the fact that fabulous, we flattened the curve and we're on the decrease, suddenly their cases are increasing again for different reasons. This has led us to fears of how long is this virus actually going to last? 
And as a result, how long is it going to make the global economy incredibly ill? which is where we take you to the next slide. And this looks at three different scenarios, looking at GDP, which is again, the wealth of nations. We're looking at how, if we see the chart itself, how countries have dropped dramatically in their rates of growth. That is a rate of growth, not just in the revenue that they have, but the employment opportunity as well. So the feeling is, if we get off relatively easy, best-ish case scenario is that ultimately this virus only lasts until summertime, the pandemic moves on and we're looking at a recession of about minus 1.5 to minus 3%. So just imagine your bank account losing 1.5 to 3% of its value. It's manageable, not comfortable at all, but it's manageable. Then there could be a situation of crisis where we've actually got the world waiting until it slows in summer, but then we come back with a resurgence at the end of the year. This could put us into an up to minus 5.5% decline in global GDP. Deep crisis can go down to almost 10%, and that means we're going into spring of next year. This makes for a very painful time ahead. The important thing is that we've got countries and the global community watching this around the world to make sure we can do whatever we can to protect the degree of damage, making sure people can get back to work, but keeping them safe in a way that doesn't allow the pandemic to spread and resurge. That's important. But how does this link to us as an industry? This is where it gets very interesting. And ultimately what we've seen, and we talked about this last week, is that the length of time of this crisis is going to very significantly impact not just the economy, but the comfort of people in the concept of going outside their doors. Right now, our doors, our borders, and our skies have stopped. We're all being kept in which means when we actually get a chance to go out, because this is an invisible crisis, are we going to feel comfortable? What we know right now is we're expecting about a 20 to 30% drop in global travel and tourism, which means that travel and tourism economy is dropping by up to a third this year, which takes us back to 2013 levels. Frighteningly, that could cost the global economy 500 billion US dollars. More importantly, it's 100 million jobs. On average, a million jobs are being lost a day because of this crisis. We need to do what we can get ultimately back on our feet again. And how are we finding this? This is the important thing. While there is an enormous amount not known, what we have confidence in is that domestic tourism is going to start first for two reasons. A, as we've said, the comfort zones of people expanding, being more comfortable traveling around home to friends and loved ones and within their borders because they understand their country's health policies. They'll take car trips, going on trains, maybe some regional flights, but importantly, they're ultimately going to be looking at that from the economic point of view as well. And this is where it's important because governments know ultimately it's up to travel and tourism to help rebuild the country's economy. The global economy we know is driven by travel and tourism because of all the supply chains that it actually touches. That's going to have a huge impact on how countries get back on their feet and guarantees governments are going to be telling their citizens holiday here. Go out, travel again, but stay within your country to help build back your country. But are we really going to see confidence that quickly? Not necessarily. This page tells an interesting story. If we look at once the doors open and the flights are back in the air, IATA is telling us, the International Air Transport Authority is telling us that ultimately, they're looking at about 15% of people who are going to go straight back to the airport. They're happy to. And in all likelihood, they're probably going to be business travelers because they need to get the business going again. They need to get from A to B so they can change the bottom lines. We have majority of the people, 40% looking at mm, not really wanting to for the next, uh, next six months, ultimately. But then we've got people looking at waiting a year or so to travel. They just don't want to take the risk. They're not comfortable. They don't want to be in an aircraft. They don't want to be in a hotel. So confidence levels are very low in that regard. It'll be interesting to see how this changes over time in terms of confidence of stepping out and need to step out. We're not used to being home for 100 days or more. So we'll see how this evolves. Demi and I'd love to hear from your indicator perspective. What are you finding? Well, we've got two pieces of data for you today, <clears throat> both from the hotel industry. The first one is from Smith Travel Research, STR, and they are reporting that abandoned hotel projects in Europe for the first quarter of the year 
is increased by 1,030%. Relatively, that's a little bit more than 10 times as many hotel projects that were under development at different stages have been abandoned. It's clearly easy to understand why. In an industry with 8% occupancy right now, many owners and investors are saying, I'm going to withdraw that cash, stop that project. There's no point in building rooms. It's a negative, obviously, for all the people that were investing in this, for the operating companies that were planning to manage these hotels and the jobs that they were going to create. However, in an industry where there is only 8% occupancy, it's probably not necessarily a bad thing to not have all the potential rooms coming on the market at the same time. I've got a second piece of data for you as well. And that uh, the American Hotel and Lodging Association is reporting that 70% of hotel employees in the United States are now unemployed. I mentioned this last week, but last week, the number that they were forecasting was 50%. Already now that's gone up by 40%, we're at 70%. And I think there's, several critical things here. One is, unfortunately, that that's an enormous amount of people that are out of work. Secondly, that increase from one week to another just goes back to the theme from last week about uncertainty. We're not yet sure the implications of COVID-19 on the industry. and We're constantly reevaluating how it's impacting uh, the industry, firm, and people. And hence the need to constantly stay alert and watch these kind of indicators to see if things are continually getting worse or when we start to see things getting a little bit better. But as you can see from both these numbers, everybody agrees on one thing, the hotel industry is in trouble right now. So I wanna share the results from the first poll that we just asked you a few minutes ago, and then we'll take a few questions. Maybe they've been coming in, and if not, I know we have some questions from last week and from the emails, the really tremendous amount of emails we got and we appreciate. Let's look at this result, okay. So 50% of people seem to be willing to go eat in a restaurant um, within two months of restrictions being lifted. That seems to be the number one choice. Um, and then 34% 34 of you are saying you will do all of the above. Very few are saying that you would do none, that's 9%. And a few would just take a flight or just stay in, one person would only stay in a hotel. So I think on my side, Anita, this is basically suggesting that our audience were probably you know, largely uh, is largely made up of travel, hospitality, and tourism students and professionals will be the first ones to be out there uh, enjoying the, the great things that hospitality, travel, and tourism have to offer. It may be a little bit less concerned and maybe even more importantly, more trusting of those businesses than the general public. I don't know what you think. It's a great point, Damien. Let me say one thing I'm loving about seeing this is the fact that it is indeed the younger generation that's looked, so I've suddenly aged myself. It's the younger generation that ultimately is going to be the first out because as you're saying, a third were willing to actually start you know, traveling, going to restaurants, going on airplanes and using hotels immediately. That is fantastic. And interestingly, that is a massive opportunity because this is where you're actually going to get hotel companies and other establishments needing the input of the younger generation of students, graduates, people who are already working to shape the future of tourism to make sure that they're actually leveraging what is it that those new travelers, those really more courageous ones and more determined are going to want first, not the traditional model for the older generation. That's a great, great result to see. Yep, I agree with you. Um, Sarah, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. So Shrey asks, do you foresee large hospitality firms withdrawing their investments and involvement in development projects in developing countries? I absolutely do. I think you've got a couple of things. First, I think real estate investors and hotel companies are all being a little bit more cautious about their investments right now, and they will be going forward. I don't think it's specifically because it's a developing nation or an emerging economy. I think it's going to be a, a more general uh, philosophy that they have. However, you know, that risk return relationship is important and the risk in developing nations might be perceived as higher than in more stable gateway um, uh, and, and, and larger economies. And so we may see more abandonment of projects there. Um, this actually will be something we'll look at next week when we focus a bit more on the real estate sector. Damien, you said something really important there that it's actually not about developing countries. To your point, developers are looking at all of their investment and everywhere where they're looking and needing to be very prudent about how they invest. 
ultimately it's developing countries that can often often offer a higher ROI because there are new markets that are opening up. So it's not about, as you say, developing per se, it's about where's the higher ROI. If anything, I would, I would guess that it's more saturated city type developments that will fall off first in the longer term. It's just managing the pipeline in more developing markets for first priority once the markets open up again and it's safe to invest because yeah. travelers are busy. Yeah, and I agree about the large city. I mean, the, the, the big fear right now is large city convention hotels where you have meetings, you have many people in close proximity. There's a lot of fear about those hotels. So I'd be guessing that those projects are the ones most likely abandoned. Whereas smaller, maybe more uh, rural and resort type properties where uh, the environment can be controlled a bit more and you may have less people, boutique hotels, small B&Bs, they may be the ones that people are looking to continue that investment or less likely to to draw back on. Indeed. Sarah, do you have another question? Yes. Ricardo asks, on the previous slide, you mentioned that the demand for flights will decrease due to uncertainty. However, do you think that the decrease in oil price will significantly decrease the price of flights and thereby potentially increase the demand for traveling? It's, it's a really, really good question. I must say, I love the calculation and the mental gymnastics behind it. One thing I find fascinating about aviation per se is that we often think it's about the travelers and we forget that it's about the trade. And this is where with the decrease in the price of oil, it's going to help enormously when aircraft pick up again in terms of trade and moving manufacturing supply chains into a higher level of activity. So that will very much benefit the cost of aviation being able to get again the supply chains going. Will it impact the travel and tourism price in terms of actual passengers itself? Again, that, that's a huge calculation around yield management, trade proportion vis-a-vis -vis traveler proportion. The price of oil always has an impact, but when you look at actually how the pricing is done for the airline ticket per se for passengers, it's many, many, many components. So if the price of oil drops by 40%, do we anticipate passenger travel to drop by 40%? Highly unlikely, because it's a small proportion of the actual cost of the travel itself. But the fact that we will be having aviation getting back up in the air again, first for trade and then for more localized travel is a good thing because it allows the airlines to get in sooner, more cost effectively to then be able to offer what ultimately travelers want. Because even if the price of oil goes down, we know there's going to be hesitancy and people getting back in the aircraft. So that will also impact travel and by implication, the airports as well and fees. So it's an important calculation, but I'm really pleased the question was raised because it allows us to look at aviation for its entire holistic value, both in the belly of the plane and with passengers and not just the passengers per se. Yeah, I think it's very important to just always remember that all these industries are interlinked so so tightly and so um, importantly with, with one another that we need to be keeping an eye on all segments of this value chain. I'm going to move us along now. We'll come back to some more Q&A a little bit later. We, we want to see um, not only data, but we like to also look more qualitatively at, at what's been going on in the industry over the last week. So Anita and I each independently choose a few headlines that have struck us during the week. We haven't shared these with each other. Um, because we really do want to have a conversation and not a, a prepared script for you. So Anita, I'm going to start with my first headline of what was going on this week. And it's from Business Traveler and it says, Stay sa Safe Stays. Accord develops certification plan for virus-free accommodations. There's a couple things going on here. One is the hotel companies, just like restaurants and airlines and, and every business, is going to have to make a great effort to gain the trust not only of the um, investors, but also of their, of their customers and also their employees. And so anything that they can do to A, you know, provide a safe and, and clean environment that's virus free is of course most appreciated and necessary. But second, communicating this to the customers, employees and others um, is going to help bring people back in and allow them to feel a little bit more reassured when they do that. Similarly, Marriott is initiating a completely new way of uh, cleaning their hotels. They have a whole new uh, disinfection system that they're going to be using to fumigate the rooms, et cetera. And they're making a big, a big um, push on this to, again, start to send that message to travelers that we, we understand 
that we need to up our game a little bit and we've got this council that's going to be investigating this. So I think the last point on this slide is the fact that this is an opportunity for people, right? We have, we have this job issue in the industry, so many people laid off, uh, jobs that are gonna come back may be different, but there are new opportunities, right? Who, who out there is going to start a new certification company, new cleaning companies, come up with a new system for doing this? How about people who need jobs and can't find the old ones starting to say, what can I do in these hundred days where I'm not working? Can I learn more about hygiene? Can I get certified? Can I uh, develop some new product or some new system? So that, that, that headline sparked my interest, not only for what it means for the hotel industry, but what it means for job seekers. Great choice. Thank you. My second headline is from um, Restaurant Weekly, why the coronavirus shutdown will upend delivery services for good. I've been reading a lot of reports about how, while you know, in, dine, in restaurant dining has decreased or shut down almost completely around the world, delivery services are up 50 to 75% in most places. And that's one story. <clears throat> but I think the real story here is, what will the future of delivery be like? And again, opportunities for people who need jobs and careers. How important will this be in the future? Up until now, in the last few years, we've seen the rise of a lot of companies like Uber Eats or Smood here in Switzerland. And, and they've obviously been benefiting from this situation by having increased demand for their services. But restaurants are generally paying 20 to 30% of the, of the price of the meal to these companies for that delivery service. And if delivery grows in importance, I'm just forecasting or just assuming that these restaurant companies are going to start uh, taking back control of the delivery process, finding ways to do it themselves or finding third parties that are gonna do it more cost effectively for them because there's a limit to the length of time that they will continue to pay 30% margins and restaurants are already um, notably small for the restaurant tourists, especially independent restaurants. And so they won't, they won't continue to pay those fees in the future. And so I think, again, there's opportunity here for people to develop a better way for restaurants to either do this themselves or to do it more cost efficiently with third parties. Stunning. I love your choices, Damien. And I must say, I love how you've actually translated the headline into what is the opportunity for students and graduates now in re-engineering what their next normal is. That's really smart because that's the whole point of this 100 days. How do we use them to ready while the, rather than the doors opening up and suddenly, well, now what do we do? What are the plans? I'm going to share with you my headlines okay. because as we know now I must confess to everyone Damien and I had a conversation after last week and we agreed that he's not a pessimist he's a realist and he got tired of me calling him a grouch so I promise not to call you a grouch anymore this is my last global broadcast of that term so you being a realist I love your choice and what I've done for myself, me being an idealist, is I pulled out a couple of choices that look at it from more a, not necessarily a technical perspective, but a more humanity, humanitarian perspective. Mm -hmm. I thought this was very interesting and it actually links to your first headline with air passengers undergoing COVID-19 blood tests before boarding. And this being created by Emirates Airlines in the UAE. Amazing airline, spectacular in its growth, in its courage, their experience delivery is amazing. And importantly, they're a global hub. So they are constantly connecting travelers, not just in and out of the Middle East, but around the world. This I thought was very interesting for a couple of reasons. A, the testing is happening, which is brilliant. But I always wonder, like you had with your example and the headline saying virus-free hotel, which admittedly was probably the journalist, not the, the hotel company itself. But what happens if you get associated with that term? A, it, can it mean that your competitors have the virus if you're virus free, but also subconsciously, does it plant a seed in people's minds that Hotel X, Airline X has, doesn't have, does this. So in the future, when hopefully these, these health and hygiene practices become standard protocols, Will people remember, oh, I remember Emirates did that and this is how they did it and it made difficult uh, travel in terms of the pleasure of experience. Because at the end of the day, if you go to a holiday resort, I don't want to walk in and smell bleach. I'm still going there for a holiday. So how does one manage the subconscious messaging of an, a company trying to do really well by doing the right thing? Does doing the right thing leave a little bit of a 
emotional scar, taking people back to a time they'd rather forget. That links me to my second one. And please don't cringe on me, Demian. However, as we know, we live, <laughs> we live in a world that is now about working from home. And reality can be a little bit contorted. And I saw this on Twitter and I thought it was hilarious, not only for the pictures, and this is specially chosen for my gorgeous Grace, who works on my team alongside with Je lovely Jessica, but I thought it's so true. It's so true. And the number of times I've had people mortified turning on their videos because they just thought it was an audio call and not video. This is very true. And I'm quite confident that those little puppies from the waist down still have their pajamas on. But it does show a lot about how even when we're working from home, we have to be very conscious of our personal brands. Just because I'm actually sitting in my lounge and you now have access to my home as everyone does, doesn't mean I can leave a basket full of laundry behind because at the end of the day, I still need to be professional. I still need to be reflective of my personal brand as a business, making sure that my home environment is a magnification of that. So I thought this was very cute. But before we go to the next video, I chose a really special one, Damien. I promise you, I chose such a special one. But then we got all of the poll results and all of the emails in over the last week. And I had so many people, after you said last week, I can choose a video every week and I can do my little poke in the eye. I thought, I thought, great, I chose one. It was perfect. It was under three minutes as you asked. But we got so many emails from people saying, can we see the KLM video again? Yeah. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, oh, I would. So I'm going to show one more time. I'm not. I promise you. Shame your eyes. <laughs> I promise you not. I have a video chosen, which kind of links to this one, which we'll go on to next. It was created, funnily enough, by a colleague of mine in the travel and tourism industry who has a foundation called Just a Drop. It's a global aid agency that ultimately uh, has supplied over a million children with, with fresh water. And her husband came up with a brilliant idea because he recognized ultimately that in these times, no one can get a haircut. So there are a lot of beards growing out there that shouldn't be happening. So he turned just a drop into the just a haircut challenge and challenged men to have their hair cut at home and donate the money to just a drop. I'll show you the video now. I'm risking a home haircut to support Just A Drop, who are providing hand washing facilities in countries that are desperately fighting COVID. I challenge you to hashtag Just A Haircut, then donate the cost saved to Just A Drop through the link attached. Please pass the challenge on. Many thanks. Now, what I love about that video is if you look at his wife, Fiona's smile, she's having a little bit too much fun hacking his hair off. And that was the third take. We were speaking this weekend when I asked her permission to use her video, and we've now evolved it into just a hair color, because ultimately you're going to make a lot more money out of women getting their, color, their hair colored at home during these times than haircuts. But I thought this was brilliant. To date, they have over 1,500 pounds that has been gained for the purpose of an agency that still needs the money going forward, even though people are worried about their own finances. Brilliant idea, smart idea of this time, just I think a few pretty scary men's haircuts in the world right now. So there you go. Great cause, I'm all for it. I had this haircut done at home the other day. I'll, I'll make a donation as well. Uh, I love the fact that the video was less than 30 seconds. I appreciate that as well. Um, and what I wanna do now, if it's okay, is ask the audience a second poll question that we're gonna actually discuss the results in just a moment with, uh, with our two guests. We will see those results in just a moment. And as you saw on the previous slide, um, we have two great guests with you, uh, with us for you today. We have Olivier Bracard, who is the CEO of Hosco, and we have Keith Kevjin from Etos, also the Chief Executive Officer. And we asked them to be here with us today because we wanted to discuss this idea of the next normal um, in terms of employment, career, personal development with two people, probably two of the most uh, senior experts in this field in the hospitality industry. So we're gonna welcome them aboard. 
All right, here we go, results. It looks like most people are somewhat confident. We've got 52% are very confident and somewhat confident. And then we've got about 30% um, are not confident or not confident at all with the remainder there in the middle. So a bit more of these uh, of our audience are more confident as opposed to not confident. Um, first impressions on that. Um, Keith, you wanna start? Yeah, um, I, I would say uh, it's all over the board, which is what I would have expected. Uh, I think you'll, you'll see in most folks uh, that they'll either be overconfident or underconfident about what will happen. I suspect uh, as long as we don't have a huge second wave that by Q4, I think this industry is, is going to have a significant bounce back. Uh, but that's a big if. Uh, and in no one's control, at least on this uh, particular webcast. So I think that's probably the big issue. But I think, again, if we don't have a big, huge second wave, uh, I think this industry is going to bounce back in a significant way. So it, it really depends. OK, Olivier, first thoughts on that? Anything different from Keith? Well, I think, you know, it, it all makes sense. A certainty is uh, extremely high. And, uh, and this is what we're saying daily when talking with our partners at Hosco. Uh, a lot of them are seeing a short term with a lot of uncertainty and very limited recruitment activity. And we'll need to wait for 2021 to see a lot more chances uh, of hiring with, a, with the jobs that actually talent are giving priority for. Great. And I purposely didn't introduce you. I wanted to get your really immediate reactions to that data. I'm going to ask if, if you guys could each give me 30 seconds maximum. Tell us about your companies, because I'm not sure everybody knows who, who you are. Uh, maybe, Olivia, you want to start about Hosco. Yeah, sure. Look, we are a, we're a tech company. We're based in uh, Barcelona, Dubai, and, and Geneva. Uh, we now operate uh, the largest professional network for the hospitality industry online. And uh, look, we exist to support talent employers and schools in the world with technology and content. And this is why we're born and this is why we strive for. Perfect. And Keith? Yeah, Ethos Consulting uh, Group. We're probably one of the largest executive search firms in the world. Uh, we have locations uh, around the globe uh, and uh, headquartered in the United States. But again, uh, global presence. We're also a a multi-service firm. So beyond executive search, we're involved in compensation consulting, advisory, uh, employee assessment, coaching, and things of that nature. Okay, great. And I mean, the audience can probably tell that's why we've got you on this show, because you, you have the, the pulse of the industry in terms of employment, as well as uh, maybe some data on what's going on and help our, our audience understand more the situation and, and, and steps that they can take. You know, we call this episode the next normal. So I'm going to ask you, um, a very short answer. What, is, what does the next normal mean to you with regards to employment or careers? Keith, can I, can I ask you to go first? A couple words, one word? Yeah, unfortunately, I'd say confused. Uh, I think it's going to be a very confusing time, uh, and normal is probably not the word I'd use. Uh, okay. It's probably going to be very confusing. So maybe we should have called it the next abnormal. Yeah. Good. All right. Yeah, I agree with you. And Olivier? Look, I think it's, it's interesting. What's the new normal? Is it the one that we have in the six to 12 months or the one that is back when, uh, when the recovery is, is more instant? I think short term, uh, I'd say a shift of power. Uh, we're coming from an industry that a month ago had 80% uh, of countries facing a talent deficit, right? So employers truly struggling to find people. And now uh, a month later, uh, we have a total shift of power with uh, an overall supply of talents versus a very, limit, very limited supply of jobs. I think this shift of power will have consequences and, uh, and especially for talent. Uh, it will go to the other side again, but this is a new normal, I think, for the next six to 12 months. Yeah, that's a good point. Sorry, Sorry I was just going to say I had a lot of, you know, I could see over the last year or two, my students getting three, four, five job offers, competitive and people outbidding for them. Mm -hmm. And now I'm concerned the, the exact opposite is true. Mm -hmm. Of course. Just a quick question, because I think one thing that was interesting, and it came up last week when we had a, a lovely executive speaking to us in the future of hospitality and jobs. And one thing that came back from um, the feedback from our viewers was that it's so important to stay positive. Absolutely, we need to stay positive. We're looking at a bounce back. The things are going to be confused, as is said now. But as much as 52% of the people were somewhat confident or very confident, one in four that responded to the poll were concerned. 
I want to flip this around a little bit. And so for those who are more buoyant in terms of confidence, that's brilliant. And we just hold on, we keep holding on. But one in four people being concerned concerns me. And how, both of you, how would you give concrete in these hundred days, this is what you need to look really closely at to keep people future focused in a way that's productive and can increase the hope? I would say it's it's really twofold. If you're talking about younger folks, uh, I think people who are 20 years in, into their careers are going to have a very difficult time of recasting themselves. But younger people, the exact opposite. Whereas uh, I would say about a third of the searches that we do every year for the past few years has been from outside traditional hospitality. So outside hotels and restaurants, it's multifamily, it's cruise, it's club, it's travel tech, and other businesses that are looking for the skill sets that hospitality people have in their DNA yes. uh, and are trained for. So I would be encouraging young people to look much further across a, a number of industries uh, for their next step. Uh, I know that sounds like, boy, I, I trained for this industry and you're going to encourage me to look outside. But the fact is, uh, you can jump back in. That these skill sets are transferable uh, and in many ways could be a real positive if you do it right. So I would be looking much more broadly and encouraging young people to be looking much more broadly at their careers and their first or second job in any industry. It's funny you say that because in our first poll, one in three people polled said they're going to want to travel immediately, which means our industry better be ready for those younger travelers with confidence because the older ones are staying home. Olivier, do you have any thought on that in terms of the 25%? The what can they do now? Well, I think um, we need to, to be aligned with the time frame. I think uh, all needs to be very realistic with the expectations that we can have, right? Uh, we run a couple of uh, surveys and research with our employer space. We've got nearly 8,000 employers. And we've asked them, uh, when do you plan on hiring again? Uh, when do you expect your team to be back at the side of pre-COVID? And, uh, and all in all, we're looking at an 18 month time frame. This is what employers are telling us. Uh, we reach 90% of employers expecting to have the size of their teams pre-COVID. -pre uh, and we, we need 18 months to be there. Uh, so we need to be very realistic with the outlook. So, the outlook for the remainder of uh, 2020 is, uh, is uh, not looking very great, to be honest, but the recovery will start happening from Q1 2021. So it, all in all, it means that all talents have six to nine months ahead of us in which if you need to work, you need to go the extra mile. Uh, you need to, to network more than ever before, research more than ever before, uh, and you need to be flexible. You might not start or find the job that you've always dreamed for to, to join the workforce. Uh, you might need to go to other industries to start with another career path, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some positive learnings in all experiences, and you will be able to bring this back to, to your next job from 2021 onwards. Hmm. Yeah, Thank I, you very much. I think I, what I wanted to pick up on there was this idea that Keith mentioned, and Olivia, you, you, you jumped in there as well, something similar, which is it's okay to leave the industry while you have to develop some skills that you may not have necessarily been able to develop within the hospitality industry. So when you jump back in later, you are differentiating yourself maybe from some people who haven't done that with a new sk skill set, with new experiences, with mm -hmm. increased personal development. I'm not saying you must, but if there are six to nine months uh, till next year, it's, et cetera, till people are hiring again, you've got to take advantage of that and find some way to, to strengthen your profile. And, okay. I, and I think uh, I just relate a very personal experience. Um, I graduated uh, when the financial crisis started, mm -hmm. and this is what pushed me to be an entrepreneur. If uh, it pushed me to go out of my comfort zone, if I had a very nice salary and very nice bonuses at the end of the month and new jobs every 18 months, I don't know if I would have the courage to, to try. And so I think these are opportunities to take risks as well and go out of our comfort zone. And one is starting their own company as well. That's great. Question for you both, a little trick question. We've said 18 months, we anticipate this going on, yeah. six to nine months in terms of really working on and being flexible for what can be done. If you both could choose two areas of study or courses people could look at right now in the next six to nine months to say that's a really interesting skill to add on because we've got so many institutions as well that are offering free learning. Mm. What would they be? What would they be? Two courses, two areas of study. 
I think it's so specific to anyone, right? But um, I would personally bet for something that I will be in need at one point of my career, which is leadership. Uh, leadership is, is critical, especially in those crises. You will need leadership uh, either it's to manage a team of two or to manage a team of 100 people. Leadership is key. Communication is key. You know, crisis management is key. So I would bet on leadership. And why not on coding? Uh, tech is uh, going to become more and more present everywhere, especially in hospitality. So I've always been curious around the coding and why not? You have some great three to five weeks coding courses. And just for the mindset, I think it can be very beneficial. Brilliant. Keep advantage of Olivier going first. He just took two. Of, uh, <laughs> Shame. Uh, Sorry, Keith. <laughs> no, no, that said, I would always uh, include pricing. I think the technology, not revenue management per se, uh, but pricing in general. I think there's going to be a lot of question moving forward about how to price all of these services. The question you received around the airline is really about a pricing issue. So I, I think that's gonna be, uh, again, a very key issue. I'd, I'd encourage people to, to be looking at how can I get smarter on pricing. Hmm. I love the coding answer, um, which I, I clearly would have been your answer, Keith, if you'd gone first, but I love it because I think that's something a lot of people who, especially who have studied hospitality may, and tourism may not have had the chance to really ex explore in any depth. And now they may have some time either because they're out of work or they're finishing school and. Um, still looking for that job, and that's a great skill to say, okay, I've never had the chance. I'm going to, to learn something completely new, and I may not become an expert coder, but I'll understand it. I'll be able to be in conversations about this more, maybe with my, my programmers. If I'm an entrepreneur or I'm working at a company, it's just going to elevate my game a little bit. Hmm. Um, you know, maybe one, one, one last thing that is maybe a bit more personal and out of the box, but uh, still consider myself to be young. I graduated uh, 13 years ago. But, you know, I reflect and uh, life goes on so quickly. I've never had a hundred days for myself to stop and reflect on what actually drives me or to be close to my loved ones or to think about what could be my ideal next move, you know. And I think this is a unique opportunity that people might not, you know, recognize. But I would truly uh, enjoy this period of time because it's truly unique in a career. I agree. Yeah, Olivier, I, I would say the same, same thing there. I, I've probably read more books. Uh, listen to more webcasts, podcasts, every other cast in the last uh, five weeks than I ever have, because not only do I have the time, I'm curious. I'm trying to seek out information. I want to understand what other leaders in various industries are saying and thinking about this period of time. So I, I think it's, it's a great thing to be thoughtful and to really look at a learning opportunity in all of this. I think if our mindset is aligned on this, if our mindset is how can we come out of this better? I think one thing that COVID will have pushed is uh, the culture, the lifelong learning culture mindset. You know, that is, uh, there's so much uncertainty that just we want to research what's going on and understand what's going on and be better prepared for tomorrow. And this, uh, this, is, uh, this is great, I think. This was on the agenda, but just gave it a massive boost, I think. I would say another thing I'm desperate for, uh, Anita, uh, Damien, is, is to be with other people. And, and that is never going away. I, I just don't see that once this thing passes, that our industry is suddenly going to be so different. We're about communing. We're about gathering. We're about enjoyment. And if that goes away, the human race goes away. So I'm, I'm very bullish longer term, but there's going to be some short term pain. Yeah, we agree. And that's why we wanted to focus not on what's the, what, are, what's, what are the industry going to be like in five or 10 years, because that's it's too hard to understand that. But for people right now, what matters is the next six months, the next year, what should they do with these 100 days? And what, what will be their story that they can tell people that they lived through and, and did for themselves during these days? Look, Anita and I have lots of questions, but this is a conversation. This is a conversation with the audience, not just for them. So I'm going to ask Sarah to jump in. Um, and give us a question or two for, for our guests, please. Sure. We've had a lot of questions come in. Um, so both of you mentioned to look at other industries a lot. Do you have some specific examples of what these industries might be? I think that there's maybe two ways you guys can take this. What industries might be hiring and what industries would give them the skills that you think would be most useful? That, that, that's really the answer, Damien, is who's hiring. Yes. And that's easy enough uh, to do that research. All you have to do is go on LinkedIn, go on 
any of the job boards, you'll see that uh, those folks are hiring. The news is actually pretty good uh, when Amazon wants to hire 100,000 people, that makes headlines. So I think that's really where I would be looking. Look at the headlines, do the research, look at the job boards and find out where are the industries that are hiring. But I would again say, look more broadly. Every industry has a service component. We did a search for, uh, for Mercedes Benz a few years back in customer service. Okay, you wouldn't think of Mercedes Benz as a, manu a car manufacturer. Well, it isn't. And so I think that there is every industry is really looking and has a component of service that we could and hospitality people could be looking at as an opportunity for a career advancement. Great. Olivier, any other idea there? No, well, I mean, we're aligned on this. Obviously, as you can imagine, over the last two months, we've had a, a drop, right, from inbound requests from employers asking for activity for talent. But we keep on receiving some. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, elderly houses, private clinics, retail groups, and all of these are service industries that want to provide superior human to human interactions and therefore truly value soft skills. And now they have the luxury of cherry picking the very best talent of the industry. So there, there will be an increasing amount of opportunity there. Great. Uh, just a quick example, even a traditional business like the restaurant business, we had a client saying they're going to have to hire 700 people back within the next 90 days because they're going to have to reopen. And they said probably 50% of those people, they won't hire back and are looking to upgrade. Hmm. So it just gives you a sense of, you know, they'll hire A's and B's back, but not hiring C's and D's back. So there will be opportunity even within this rehire period. Not everyone is going to go back to their pool uh, in every situation. So I, I think that there is going to be an interesting opportunity, especially for younger people, uh, to move into even the traditional aspects of our business. Interesting, Keith, you mentioned something that, um, especially it links to what you both been saying about the 100 days and, and going and doing things that you wanted to do. There were a lot of people before all of this crisis happened that were not happy with their jobs to begin with. So yeah. do you want to go back to the same job? This is a great opportunity to use this time to plug in the skills that allow you to get to your point pushed into a different role that's actually far more aligned with what you want to do. So it does, it's been a really interesting hit of the pause button for everyone everywhere and all dimensions of their lives to just check and see, is this really what I'm wanting? That's an interesting point. I think you can also see a push for entrepreneurship as Olivier said uh, in passing, but I, I, I think I'd like to go back to that is I do see a real opportunity for even young people to find a niche, find a passion, and get enough financing to potentially run their own shops. It might be a, a one, two person business at the start, but I, I really think that entrepreneurship is going to flourish uh, after all this is over. It's yeah. funny you say that because as someone who opened, started their own business 18 years ago, the agony we feel every single day about keeping our business alive is now what people in safe jobs are feeling on a daily basis. So it's been very equalizing from that perspective. We're just used to that angst in a productive way. So. Yeah, and we, we agree completely about the idea of innovation and entrepreneurship um, being at the forefront right now, what people should be considering. And we've, one of our future episodes in a couple of weeks is really gonna be focused on the entrepreneurship and innovation aspects. Sarah, right. let's take another question. So one of the biggest learning points for companies during this crisis is how they've been able to maintain their business from a distance, which is very difficult in the hospitality industry yet. Do you think that there will be a shift in the hospitality industry and that there will, we will reconsider working from home? So guys, how, uh, how, how much inroad can working from home take in the hospitality industry going forward? And are there other are areas where are gonna be more, more prone? I think, yeah, I, I think it's gonna still be a very small percentage of the jobs that are available in this industry because we are such a person-to-person -person delivery system. But revenue management, finance, certain areas of human resources, uh, certain kind of sales maybe uh, uh, would be appropriate. So there'll be, 
a lot of opportunities to work from home, but in, a, in the grand scheme of it, on a macro basis, it's going to be a very small percentage, I believe. I would agree. Lionel, just on, on top of this, I think one of the learning is, is distance learning, L and D. You know, we've asked our employers, what is top of mind right now for you? And obviously, the top three is uh, financial management, uh, health and safety of the staff, and uh, keeping contact with the staff. But the number four was upskilling and reskilling of the staff at a distance. You know, and uh, I think off offline face-to-face -face training is going to get a huge hit, and there is a huge opportunity for distance learning boom in our industry, which is great because too many of our staff didn't have access to any LND opportunity. And this is a big reason why talents escape from the industry and turn to other industries. So I think there is a huge opportunity to transform LND into a more online version of it. And that will be very beneficial for the industry. We just did a strategic alliance with an online learning group that works with a lot of universities. Mm -hmm. So Damien, uh, your university ought to be thinking about this, uh, but we've already done a strategic uh, alliance this past month for this very reason. And this is, and this makes a lot of sense for all players. I mean, looking at ourselves, converging jobs and learnings makes so much sense. You want a better job, you're going to learn something. And this is something we will be embedding in Hosco beyond the job to support uh, talents from one opportunity to another. Right. So this is just, this has uh, accelerated this agenda, which was a, uh, really a pending agenda and hopefully LND will, will, uh, will be much stronger as the access to LND. I think just to link a couple ideas here, you know, this idea of 100 days, what should I do? I need to, you know, up my game a bit, this idea of education. You know, just on LinkedIn alone, I've seen at least a dozen different schools or programs offering courses they used to charge for, for free right now for our industry. Um, and so there's no reason why people, the audience can't enroll in some of these. There's a great certificate program at um, Florida Atlantic University in, in America. Peter Rich is doing an amazing thing. I think almost 100,000 people have received a certification for continued education in the area. My school is offering some classes that normally are, they charge for. They're offering a version of this complimentary as well. And there's plenty of other organizations. So I think there is opportunity for people who aren't employed to continue their education through programs like this. Anita, if it's okay, I'm going to take one more question for the guys. Sarah? Sure. Um, so how strong of an advantage will proven immunity be to COVID-19 for job candidates? Will employers be allowed to get access to medical certification? Maybe we should add a badge on the Hosco profile, right? <laughs> like that's a very good point. <laughs> Let's see. I, 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 until there's a vaccine, I have to believe that that is a competitive advantage. Uh, and whether someone needs to ask you or you're willing to tell someone that uh, that's a fact and you can prove that, I got to believe it's some kind of short-term advantage. Yeah, for sure. I, th I do think I read that the WHO was saying, be careful with this because th th you can't prove immunity yet and this antibody testing hasn't been that clear yet. So, but I would agree, if, if they do you know, sanction this and say, okay, the, the, the tests work, we can check for this, I think it'll be, a, a, a part of the industry for the short term. Well, it depends on the country, though, because it depends on information security permission. Sure. Like in the UK, you wouldn't. I'm quite sure. I speak. I stand to be corrected, but I'm pretty sure you'd, you'd have I'm a not, hard time asking that. Yeah, and I'm suggesting that the the employee would be telling rather than being yes, asked that, uh, to let Great people point. know. Hey, I got this. I, I'm over it. Or hey, I was asymptomatic and uh, I'm available to work anywhere, anytime. Uh, that has to be, again, a short-term advantage of some sort. Hey guys, I just took a look at the clock and I realized how, uh, how far behind schedule we are. So I'm gonna have to end the interview now, but um, for, for the audience, we will take, Anita and I will take some more questions after the show again. And if there are questions for the guys, we will forward those to them and maybe they have some time to send us an answer to later. Keith, Olivia, thanks so much for spending this time with us. Thank great you. advice and great insights for our audience. Really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Thanks both so much. Okay, okay thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.
Stunning. Demi, that was brilliant. And I think the fact that we ran over time was a reflection of the richness of content that was coming. So thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. And thank you to Keith and Olivier for sharing so much and giving such constructive feedback. If anything, it shows that the concerns out there are very real because there are a lot of doors shutting, but there are a lot of windows opening as well. So we're now going to transition as we head towards the final section of the, of the program itself to one of my favorite areas, which is Damien being able to share his concerns and me seeing if I can find a reason to be confident within them. Damien, quickly over to you. Okay, well, given the time constraints, I'm just going to do two of my concerns, um, and I'm going to give you my first one. The first one is about restaurants. Um, I mentioned delivery before, but restaurants in most countries that I've been tracking are amongst the last businesses that are going to be reopened. And I'm worried that that's some concern that that's sending an implicit message, um, not only to customers and owners of restaurants, but also to, to the staff of the restaurants, that these places cannot really operate that safely. And so some of the measures that they're being asked to undertake, and you know, not only distancing, but um, uh, masks and hygiene issues, this is going to put a tremendous strain on the restaurants who already operate under very small margins. So my concern is, People are going to start to think that restaurants aren't that safe if they're the last things to open. And if they do open, it's going to be hard for the restaurants to make money. It's a great concern. Um, I have to smile because if you've been locked up for, for 100 days, clearly you haven't had my cooking and you're not going to need to go to a restaurant. But I think I, I, am, I, am, I am innately confident. And it goes back to what Keith and Olivier were saying. Our industry is about people coming together and communing. The poll that we put up front actually had restaurants as the number one. 50% were prepared to return as soon as the doors open. So that's really good. Is it going to be challenging for food and beverage in terms of, again, the protocols, the new protocols? I, yes, but I do think that people are going to be looking at restaurants, cafes, wine bars, whatever, as a first port of call to start adjusting to the expanding comfort zone. A, it's lighter contact it's less contact and it's close to home. So I also think as well that because of, as I said earlier, the fact that it's involved in re-stimulating the value chains, you're helping the local grocer, the local shop, the local wine bar right next door. And that's a really good part of stepping up for community. So I am concerned uh, and people want to go out. They want to be able to, not, they might not be able to hug again, but at least they want to be able to laugh again, two meters apart. So we'll see. Your second one? Second one is, um, is more focused on, well, several industries. But let's look at hotels and restaurants again. We've had a constant shift over the last 30, 40 years in the hotel industry and also in the restaurant industry towards larger change, bigger organization, right? Marriott has over 7,000 hotels. Accor has over 5,000 hotels. And they've been slowly, you know, taking over the industry in lots of ways, right? 80% um, of new hotels are branded. They belong to these chains. And so, there, of course, there are still independent hotels and smaller hotels. Restaurants, the same thing. Big chains um, growing much quicker. Smaller restaurants having a tough time to, to succeed. And, you know, one in five restaurants closes. Uh, I think it's within two years of opening. I think it's actually a year of opening. I'm worried that this is going to get even more extreme. I think the money that's going to be necessary to provide the proper hygiene, the proper training for employees, to operate restaurants where tables have to operate, um, be placed in, in greater distance from each other, less customers in, is going to put a tremendous strain on restaurants and, and similarly for hotels. And so I think it's only going to be the large organizations that can not only afford it, but then communicate, for example, with certification like at Chorus saying to the guests that this place is virus free or cleaner than others, and it's going to push small business owners out from both restaurants and hotels. I, I listen, I'm concerned as well. Okay. I'll be honest, I'll, I, 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 looking at the poll results up front as well, the lowest statistic was 1% and that was people going back to hotels. Mm. The invisibility of what we're dealing with right now in this crisis means that I might be comfortable getting on a plane for two to 10 hours, but do I want to shut my eyes at night and not know? So I, I, I am confident that our industry and, and the human community will be able to come back and, and make our industry work again because we need it. But I, I share your concern okay. confidently. Let's take um, 
Let's take two or three more questions and then we'll wrap up. And then, like I said before, we'll stay on after the show. We'll come back on for people that want to stay on and ask more questions. Sarah, one, give me one last great question. Sure. Uh, so you mentioned that travel, tourism, and hospitality are all interlinked. Will it take a coordinated response from organizations such as IATA and hotel associations to encourage travelers and accelerate the speed for people to start traveling again in the next normal, where people might be more conscious about hygiene and sanitation? I, I promise I did not write that question and give it to someone to ask. Um, yes. Absolutely. And the good thing is that that's already happening. The, the travel and tourism and hospitality industry is an integrated supply and experience chain. We, we don't function without airlines, without hotels, without food and beverage, with all of these things. So absolutely it's going to. And that's why right at the start of this crisis, light has happened in the past. The UNWTO, WHO, IATA, WTTC, all of these different entities started working together because it was recognizing we all need to be part of the solution. Importantly, when it comes to who's going to say go, the best thing about what's happened now is that it's caused leadership to recognize who should be leading what and when. Only the WHO will be able to say it's safe to open up the borders. And this is where then as a result, the entire supply chain will need to work together. So there is no positive outcome unless there is an integrated approach of working forward. And I'm very pleased to say as recent as Friday with the G20 meeting of ministers in tourism, that is actively being planned and several different approaches are being um, effectively developed around the world to mobilize government as well as business, large business and small. Yeah, and the only thing I would add very briefly is from people that I've been speaking to at the hotel and restaurant companies and crews, et cetera, there's a lot more communication going on. There's a lot more people trying to find common solutions and try to uh, find ways to reopen together and support each other. So I'm always concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that people are recognizing that no one's gonna be able to overcome this alone and they, they need support. Look, uh, that hour flew by for me um, and I can see that most people have stayed on for the entire show. So hopefully they've enjoyed it as well. Um, what we wanna say before we leave is um, a little bit about the, the next episode. We have a week from now, uh, same time, an episode we're calling The Surreal State of Hotel Real Estate. And, and this is because everything that's happening in, in the world and in the industry is having real important implications on the underlying real estate that hotel industry is built on. And that has ramifications for jobs, for restaurants, for local businesses, et cetera. So we want to understand not really the forecast and the number side of it as much as what are the real estate issues that are, that are at play now and what do people need to be paying, paying attention to. And for that, we have a very special guest. We have Mr. Strune Robertson, who's with the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. So I hope people will join us for that. Anita? Right. So as we close itself, again, from Demi and myself, thank you, thank you for joining us. It's been a delight being with you. A couple of quick updates in terms of, for those of you who've been asking about past recordings and today's show, of course, we have a stunning new website that's going to be coming live at the end of this week. It'll be www.rise-weekly.com. You'll be able to get all of the episodes there itself, so we'll have that there. We'll also have a Q&A board, so for those whose questions don't get answered live, we'll make sure that all the questions get answered, especially if there's a particular technical expertise required, we will make sure we reach out to our industry colleagues to get it for you. So we promise you that, but that's coming live. Um, also, please con keep contact with us on Twitter and on email. You can see it's at rise underscore weekly on Twitter and rise weekly 2020 at gmail.com to email us. The more questions we get, the more content you give us, the more critiques you give us, the better we're able to work for you. So please, please make us work. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week. A little thank you to the Wizards of Oz behind the scenes, Jessica, Grace, and you all just met Sarah. And a very special welcome to Katia, an EHL grad who's going to be my intern during these 100 plus days. She's going to be joining us to help on the behind the scenes with RISE. And she's a great example 
of someone who used her networks and her sense of purpose to find a way of making sure that these 100 days really work for her. So we're thrilled to have her on board. Katia, welcome. For all of you who are celebrating around the world, Ramadan Kareem, wishing you a very, very strong one. And to everyone from us at RISE, keep well, stay warm, stay home, stay safe, and keep your hands clean. We'll see you next Monday. Take good care. Thank you, everybody.